بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحابته ومن والاه اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وقرب زدنا علما الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام to everybody we're entering into the last 10 days, this will probably be a 29 day because the we sighted the moon on, uh, well, we, we completed 30 days of Sha'ban. And uh, some of the Imam Zayd was pointing out to me yesterday that the calculators always end up fasting 30 days. And I think somebody should actually study that because you can't see the, the moon uh, for the first, usually it's, it's going to be 20 or more hours uh, before you see it. So one of the signs of the latter days is the Prophet ﷺ said that people will see the new moon, the Hilal, and they'll say, oh, this is two days old. Because they won't know that you can have a high moon if you didn't see it the first day when it was actually born. So there is a, what's called a mufaraqa, which is where, where the, 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 the sun and the moon actually come together and then the, the mufaraqa is when the, the moon begins to move out of the... And Allah arranged it so that they're perfectly fit with each other. It's one of those coincidences that the moon can eclipse the sun and the sun can eclipse the moon. So if it's, if, if it's born after the conjunction, so it separates, um, then... then uh, world records are, you know like oh, 15 hours, perfect conditions, perfect eyesight. So it wasn't anywhere near that. It was only six hours old in the Middle East. So it could not have been sighted. They fasted on Monday. And somebody actually sent me a picture of the second day the moon was high from, from the Middle East. And they said, Alhamdulillah, saha siyamuna. You know, th thank God our, fa our fasting was valid. And to me, the fact that he said that meant it was invalid because he had doubt. He had to wait till the second day. To feel, and the Prophet ﷺ named that day Yom uh, al-Shak. It's a it's a it's a mawquf hadith. You know, it's a it's on uh, Ammar ibn Yasir relates it, but but it has hukum al rafa Even though the Sahabi did not say, "I heard from the Prophet," he said, "Man sama Yom al-Shak faqad asa Abu al-Qasim." You can't say a ma'asiya if it wasn't from the Prophet. So the Sahabi doesn't necessarily have to say. Uh, that the Prophet said, he can actually say something, and if it's related to the unseen, if it's related to ghaybiyat, if it's related to signs of the end of time, if it's related to um, a hukum shar'i, then it has to be uh, marfu'a. In other words, he, he's, he's saying it in his own words, but he heard the meaning from the Prophet Sallallahu So that's, that's called mawquf bi hukm al rafa'. Right? And, and, and there's quite a few. Ammar ibn Yasir actually has more than one. So I think he, he, he might have been afraid to attribute because Sahaba, they had such fear. I mean, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was the closest of all the Muslims, you know, outside of the, obviously, his immediate family, Khadija. And, 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 but, but he burnt his hadith. So we, do, we have very few hadiths from Abu Bakr, even though nobody probably heard more from, from the Prophet ﷺ than Abu Bakr, because he had all, not only the public events, but he had the private conversations. He was his companion. He was thani ithnayn idhum firghar. Firga. He's the second of the two when they're in the, when they're in the, when they're in the cave. So, but he did not want the responsibility. He knew that all the hadiths were out there, that were needed and he did not want the responsibility. So it's a weighty thing to transmit hadith, even in this way, just to, because this is, we believe this is actually revelation. The Prophet says, This is not words from uh, human appetite or desire or whim. These are from the Prophet um in any case, the calculation is an opinion. I, don't, I think it's an extremely weak opinion. I wrote a, 
cesarean wound births, um, I thought a very convincing, compelling argument uh, for why we shouldn't uh, follow calculations. And one of the reasons is that you're gonna be fasting 30 days every, every time because you're gonna be too early, generally. So Allah Ta'ala A'lam, the sunnah is to see the moon. One of the secrets of the Prophet is he never went outside moon sighting. And we know that he had this, the, the vision of, of he, he had like a, you know, people see with telescopes. The Prophet, I don't know what the exact um, uh, power was of magnification, but the Prophet saw 12 stars in Pleiades. And, you, and that's in Qad'iyad Shifa. You can only see seven. It's called the Seven Sisters. People with extremely good eyesight can see eight. But to see 12, and if you, if you Google, you can actually see a picture of Pleiades blown up with a telescope. There are 12 major stars in it. You can count them. So the Prophet ﷺ would have seen the new moon before anybody else. He would have seen it before anybody else. So the Sahaba went out to sight the moon. And uh, Shaykh Abdullah told me that he was in, in a, I won't say which country, uh, Vale of, uh, you know, Sitar is part of our team. But one of the Arabian countries, he was there and they went out to sight the moon. They asked him to come with them. So he went out. They were all looking to the east to see the new moon. And he said, no, no, it's, it's in the West. Oh, they said, mashallah, it's in the West. They didn't even, they didn't know. So this is what's happened. This is how divorced people are from natural phenomena. Whereas if you grow up like in Southern Morocco, if you grow up in, uh, in, um, in Mauritania, they see the new moon every, every month and it's an event. And istihlal, which is the birthing of the new moon, is istihlal, istihla means to shout for joy. Because when you see the new moon, and anybody who's had this experience of going out to sight the new moon, everybody gets joyous when they s first see it. And they, they usually shout. So it's just, it's a human experience um, that we've maintained in our religion, which is quite amazing. Um, to connect us to these natural phenomena, which people are increasingly divorced from, and as they increasingly become addicted to these uh, machines, that they, they're missing the, all of the, uh, the glorious wonders. I was just uh, reading an article about um, how they were teaching people um, to walk with awe. In other words, to notice small things and to notice, it's in a book called Distracted. And it's a very interesting uh, read, but, but, but they actually, people over, like they did, they did two groups. One, they just told them to take a walk and the other group, they told them to notice things, like notice flowers, notice trees, notice the way uh, the wind uh, moves uh, the, 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 the branches of the trees when, when it's rustling and listen to the rustling. And people that did that began to, it actually increased their, um, their, their mental health. They started feeling more joyous, they started feeling healthier. And that's one of the things about the Prophet said, um, there's a, one of my favorite hadiths is Mughith and Barira, um, which is in, in the Sahih. Uh, Mughith was a, a slave and Barira was uh, this woman um, who he was married to, but she wanted a divorce uh, because he was a slave and she was, she, she was free. I don't like that term slave, but in any case, he, he, was, uh, he was bonded. You know, because in Islam, the Prophet said, لا تقروا عبدي عبدي. Don't say, my slave, my slave. All of you are slaves of God. So we don't really believe in this idea of slavery. But there is a, 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 a bonded servitude that by Sharia you can get out of. Like, so it's more like indentured servitude because you, you can pay. You can actually get money from zakat. You know, if, so in any case, um, she did not want to marry him because she was a free woman and he was bonded. And so uh, Maurice would walk around following her, begging her to stay with him. And uh, the Prophet was with uh, Al-Abbas and he said, Like, don't, isn't it marvelous, the love of uh, Mughith for Barira? And then 
the fact that Barira doesn't reciprocate the love, like Tajib, he's looking at it, and that's, that's the idea of marveling at things. Like the Prophet him, he, he, he must have looked at everything with just this marveling at Allah's creation and all the different personalities and all the different types of people because he was so intensely aware of everything and alive. Um, so then, uh, Mughith asked the Prophet to intercede for her. So she went to, to um, he went to, to Barira and he said, you know, won't, won't you reconsider? And she said, are you, are you commanding or are you interceding? And, and, and he said, la, la, ashfa, I'm, I'm only interceding. And she said, I have no need for him. And so he left at that. When Mughith heard that, his heart switched and all the love for her went out of his heart because this was the human being that Allah accepts the intercession of. So how could this woman not accept the intercession of the messenger of Allah? So suddenly he switched, his heart switched and her heart switched. So then she wanted him to marry her. <laughs> She wanted to stay with him. He didn't want to have anything to do with her. It's an amazing story. Alhamdulillah. So, Bismillah. This hadith is an Anas radiallahu And Anas was, was really brought to the Prophet Sallallahu very young. He was probably about seven by his mother. And this is really the greatest home school in human history. So she's bringing him to both serve the Prophet, but to learn from the Prophet. And he becomes one of the great transmitters of hadith. So Anas ibn Malik uh, and his brother Umair, also there's a wonderful hadith where um, Anas was sad and the Prophet asked what happened. And he said his, his, his brother's pet died, the bird. He had a pet, Nughair, it was a little bird. So, so the Prophet went to visit him with Anas. And when he saw him, he was all depressed. And, and the Prophet said, Ya Umair, ma fa'ala nughair? Oh, Umair, what did the little bird do? So he's teaching him about death. That hadith has tens of ahkam in it that uh, one of the great Moroccan ulama wrote a book just on the ahkam that, that we benefited from that hadith. And one of them was the permissibility, or rather the nadab, of doing ta'ziyah when somebody's pet dies. Like actually going to them and telling them, you know, I'm so sorry to hear your pet died. Because pets, for people that have pets, pets are very often, they become part of the family. Their people are very connected to their pets. They get depressed when their pets die. So Anas uh, is amazing. And one of my favorite hadiths of Anas is the Prophet ﷺ came in the room and told him to go do something, and Anas said, la. So this is a young, he's probably seven, eight years old. This is something seven and eight-year-olds do to uh, adult authority. It's called testing limits. And so he said, la. So the Prophet ﷺ smiled, and he left the room, which is an amazing event, because the thing that children do is they're testing. They want to see what kind of reaction they get. They want to see. So the Prophet just smiled and left the room. And a little while later, he came back and he said, oh, haven't you gone to do that thing? He said, I'm leaving right now. So this is real tarbiyah. And this is why uh, Imam al-Banani, one of the great Moroccan ulama from Fez, he said in, 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 the, in, the, in the, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the hadith where Anas radiallahu said, the Prophet never said, if he did a thing, why did you do a thing? And if he didn't do a thing, why didn't you do it? He never, he, the Prophet never faulted him like that. And Imam al-Banani says, He was raising the children with an inner tarbiyah, not outer commands and injunctions, but inner, because if you, if you, if you love somebody, you want to do things for them. So if, if the child has love for the parent, they want to do, if they have fear for the parent, it's a different thing. But if they have love for the parent, then they, they want to, uh, to do things for them. 
So Anas is a very important uh, figure. So radiallahu anhu. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ثلاث من كنا فيه وجد حلاوة الإيمان. Three, whoever find there's three things in other words. Whoever finds them in him will find the sweetness of إيمان حلاوة الإيمان. من uh, you know so so من كنا فيه these three things if they are in that person وجد حلاوة الإيمان. They experience, because wajada wijdan is also experience. So it's finding, but wajada, it, has to, it, it really has to do with a, uh, w- with a discovery. You know, if they, if, if they discover these things within themselves, and that's why Allah, his, the, the attribute of, you know, what they call sifa dati or nafsiya is wujud. Because, and, and really, you could almost translate it as God has findability. In other words, God can be discovered. That we can know Allah. This is one of the great gifts of, to, of our creator to the human being. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can actually be known by Allah's creation. And so, so and, and wajada means to be ecstatic. So, so it, ha- it has the idea of, of the joy of discovery. Like people get very, the, um, so, you know, I was looking at this um, mas'ala and, and I couldn't penetrate the, it, it was, uh, and I was having a really difficult time. So I called one of my teachers. He couldn't get it either. And then there was one word that I looked up and, and I said, oh, th- this means, because we thought it meant something else. And, so, and he's much more learned than I am, but we both got it immediately. And then we were like, really got excited. And so we were was talking about what a blessing it is to, to, because he said so often you'll be alone reading and you can't penetrate something and then you discuss it with somebody else and then the meaning becomes clear to you. And so there's that joy of discovering something. And, and uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi anhu, says that a child will never discover anything except that it will come and want to share it with somebody. And, and, and he said that's a proof that the fitra is to want to share discoveries. The, 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 the joy of discovering something, you want to share that joy with other people. So finding the halawa. So what is halawa? And then uh, Ibn Abi Jamr says, لماذا عبر عن هذا بالحلاوة? And he says, because ضرب الله مثلا كريمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة. The 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 كريمة طيبة, which is iman, which is لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله. So whoever has حلاوة الإيمان, it's because they have realized حقق لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله. So Allah سبحانه وتعالى says about that that it's a it's a tree that its fruit is. Like the fruit is constant. So that he's saying that this is a real halawa of the fruit of iman. That you are tasting the fruit of iman. That it's a dhawq. So iman has a dhawq and it's a sweet taste. It's, it's the sweet. Sharia means path to water. And that water is adbun. It's, it's not a bitter water. Because Allah made two types of water, bitter water and sweet water. So the sharia takes you to sweet water. Kufr takes you to bitter water. And, and Isa in our tradition said that those who love dunya are like somebody who drinks salt water. It just makes them more thirsty until they die. So that's the nature of the dunya. So, so, he, he's, so what are these three things? أن يكون الله ورسوله أحب إليه إليه مما سواهما that Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to you than your own uh, soul. You know they're more beloved to you than anything other than Allah. Anything other than Allah, Allah and His Messenger, and the uh, famous uh, moment for Sayyidina Omar. Is he told the Prophet he said, I love you more than everything except myself. And the Prophet said, La yu'minu 
حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفس التي بين جنبي. Until I'm more beloved than the stole between the two. And he said, I, I love you more than myself. And the Prophet said, Al-an, ya Umar. Iktamal al-Iman. Your Iman's complete. And that, that wasn't a, a, like a phone, hasha. Umar is al-adal. He, he can only speak the truth. That was his. You know, some of them, it's, 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 it's where the Prophet becomes everything to you. Um, I was with somebody who was a new convert, like uh, his name Mahmoud. Uh, he, he's a new convert. We, we were in a car, and um, somebody offered him a date, and he said, I hate dates. And the Prophet, and uh, so we told him, the Prophet said, I said, love dates. He said, I love dates. And he took one. You know, so that's a real thing because, you know, you love what the beloved loves. That's, that's human nature. You love what the beloved loves. So that's the first one. That you love a person and you only love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because every other love, من أحبك لي شيء أبغضك لزواله Whoever loves you for a thing will no longer love you when that thing is gone. This is why there's marriages that end in, in divorce as, as one of the spouses gets older and loses their beauty because the person married them. For, it's very common. Uh, you know, you'll see, especially, unfortunately, amongst men, they'll, they'll marry and then the wife, they hit 40, 45, and suddenly, oh, they want a younger wife. And, and, and that's because they didn't marry them for the right reasons. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, A woman is married for four reasons. Uh, and that goes vice versa as well. I mean, the Prophet's speaking to men, but it's always مفهوم uh, المخالفة. You know, you can understand uh, when, uh, by just switching it around, the, 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 the opposite is true. So a man, there's people marry men for their looks, marry men for their money, marry men for their lineage. I mean, here, so some of the commentaries, they say that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Christians married for love, the Jahili Arabs married for, um, for nesab, for lineage, and then the, uh, the Ju Judaists married for... Um, to maintain wealth in the family. And he said, but the Muslims marry for love, for, for a deen, that those are the, that's the difference. So, so you should love a person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that people will come on the day of judgment, min qaba'ila shatta. There's no nasab uh, amongst them. And they're in the shade of Allah. And, and they said, he's, what's their quality? Mutahabbuna fillah. They loved one another for the sake of Allah. That's why mahabba is a high maqam. Um, somebody said to Abu Huraira, Uhibbuka filah. He then, he, and Abu Huraira said, Eden jaybuka uh, jaybi. Then your, your pocket's my pocket. In other words, I, your money is my money. He said, La utiquhu. I, I can't, I, that's a little too much love. Abu Huraira said, Ahbib ghairi. Go love somebody else. <laughs> Because that's real love. He, he was trying to point out to the man. I mean, Abu Huraira could care less. He was a Zahid. But he was showing him something about, you can say that glibly. You know, you could say that uh, very lightly. Oh, I love you. People say that all the time. But do you really love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In the duties of brotherhood, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali has a man who comes into a house he asked if the the owner was there, and he said no. And uh, and and he said, do, where does he keep his uh, his money? He said there. And so he took some money. When he came back, the the servant told that oh so and so came and to and he said alhamdulillah he knows that I'm his brother. You know that he would feel that comfortable uh, to do that. So and that's not something you should do with everybody, but there are people you can do that with. Um, pray doing. 
الله وأن يكره أن يعود في الكفر كما يكره أن يقذف في النار that he would detest to return to kufr disbelief or also ingratitude uh, as, as he would detest to be thrown into the fire so two of these things are about love and one of them is about hate because that's the world hub and bulb it's you know subhanalladhi kharaqal azwaja kullaha everything's created in pairs so hub the pair of hub is bulb and and that's why you can't love something without detesting something else if you love truth you will detest falsehood if you love beauty you will detest ugliness you can't love something without having a corresponding bughd and so the prophet sallallahu is is telling us that love has a counterside which is karahiya so what do you hate you hate what allah hates you hate injustice you hate lying you hate theft you hate uh, adultery you hate fornication you hate uh, backbiting you hate the things allah kariha lakum alqil wal qal right allah hates gossip so you should hate that because if you truly love allah you're going to hate what allah hates so this is a really really foundational hadith and there's a many i mean there's a lot you could go into this but i'll leave it at that so we can get more of these hadiths that are so amazing the next hadith is an uh, an ubadah ibn as-samit radiyallahu anhu and uh, this is one of the great i mean all the sahaba have their greatness but there are some obviously that have higher maqams Uh, than others because of the closeness the sahaba uh, ubada uh, ibn samit is one of the 12 nuqaba and he mentions that radiyallahu anhu kana shahida badran wa huwa ahad an nuqaba laylat al aqaba so on the on the aqaba athaniya when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took 12 nuqaba and nine were from the khazraj there were more khazraj there and the three were from the aws He was one of the, and Naqib is like Arif. You know, if you go to the Alhambra Palace, there's a section called Jannatul Arif. So the Arif is like the overseer. The, the, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, somebody who's the kafil, the, the daman, um, amin, you know, somebody who's uh, put as, in a, as, uh, as a trustee over something. So these are the nuqaba. He was um, one of the most learned of the Sahaba. Uh, he was, Omar made him a Qadi. He went to Homs initially in Syria. He was a Qadi. And then he became the first Qadi in Palestine. Um, and he, he was in Ramallah. He actually died there, but he was moved to Al-Quds. He's buried in uh, Al-Quds. There's a maqam for him there. Um, he lived to be quite uh, in his 70s. Uh, he, fought, uh, he fought in Egypt with Amr ibn al-As. So he was a mujahid as well as being uh, a scholar. He, um, he also, um, he had a conflict with Muawiyah because Muawiyah didn't like some of his judgments and he actually tried to remove him. And Abu Ubaidah went, uh, told Omar this. And Omar, who was the caliph, said no and this is the first proof that the judiciary is separate from the uh, legislative or the uh, executive so the the judiciary has an autonomy from you know the ruler can't just remove a qadi on a whim uh, so that's very important because that's something montesquieu in the spirit of the laws He's the first one that kind of introduces the idea of having a separation of powers. And, and America obviously took that uh, from that philosophy of having this legislative, uh, uh, executive, and then judicial branch. So we, we understand that also, that the, the judiciary has to be, because they have to judge against the ruler. So if the ruler has power to influence, then how can you have real justice? So we know that uh, Ali uh, had a dispute 
with uh, a Jewish man and Shurayh al-Qadi qada lil Yahudi. He uh, and Ali was the caliph. So Shurayh was his qadi. There's a famous uh, crescent story about Shurayh al-Qadi. He went out to sight the moon, you know, and one of the people with the moon sighting him, he said, I see it, I see it. He said, where? He said, there, there, you can see it, it's a crescent. And he looked, he couldn't see it. And then he looked at the man, he noticed he had a, a hair from his, his eyebrow that had curled around over his eye. So he, he wiped it away and he said, can you still see it? And he said, subhanAllah, it's gone. <laughs> So this is a very important hadith again. Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal wa hawluhu isabatu min ashabihi. So there was a group around him in, in one recension of Al-Bukhari and another. That is. So there's a group around him, isaba min ashabihi. Bay'uni. So bay'uni, he didn't say, which is very interesting, he didn't say ahiduni. He could have said ahiduni, but he said bay'uni. So the mubay'ah is a pledge, but it's related to, it's a transactional event. So in a mubay'ah, there's a transaction taking place. There's the, 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 the mubay'ah, and then there's the one at mubay'ah. So the one making the pledge, the one being pledged to. But it has a reciprocal uh, reality. So the one you're pledging to is he also has responsibilities. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Bay'uni ala Allah tu shiriku billahi shay'a, that you don't associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala tasriku. Saraqa yasriku. Wala tasriku. Wala taznu. Wala taqtulu awladukum. وَلَا تَأْتُوا بِبُهْتَانٍ تَفْتَرِينُهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَأَرْجُلِكُمْ وَلَا تَعْصُوا فِي مَعْرُوفٍ So this is almost identical to the, what's called بَيْعُتُ النِّسَاء which is in Surah Al-Mumtahana. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتُ يَبَيْعَنَّكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُشْرِكُمْ فِي بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَسْرِقْنَا وَلَا يَزْنِينَا وَلَا يَأْتِينَا بِبُهْتَانٍ بين أيديهن وأرجلهن ولا يعصي يعصينك في معروف فبيعهن واستغفر لهن الله so take bay'a with them ask forgiveness for them in Allah غفور رحيم so so that is called bay'a to al-nisa the prophet did a bay'a khasa bin nisa and in that bay'a he did with the men he actually did musafaha with the women there's different khilaf about it some say he had a cloth between him Others actually, there's a riwayah that Omar did the bay'ah with them because the Prophet said, Ma safaha imra'atan qat uh, illa mahram. He, he, he didn't, unless she was a mahram. Although there's uh, all the women were mahram to the Prophet, but this was tashiri'ah. So the Prophet said, in reality, could, he could be alone with a woman that was not, he wasn't married to. And like Aisha said, Man amlaku bi irbihim and Rasulila, who controlled himself better than the Messenger of Allah. So so um, so these points are very important. First of all, they're all nehi. It's very interesting. So they're they're not the they're not like uh unto salu, tashadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa to salu, wa to zakku, they're all nehi. So it's very interesting that the bay'ah is for the nahi. So in the hadith, uh, which is one of the foundational hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu he said, uh, ma bihi, ma anhu fantahu, right? Wa ma amartukum bihi, fa'atu bihi ma istata'atum. So, what I, what I have prohibited you, fashtenibu, avoid it, right? It's a complete nahi. Whereas with the awamir, it's what you're able to do. And that relates to len yashadadin ahadun illa ghalaba. This, nobody will take on this religion except it will overwhelm them. Because the Prophet ﷺ, you cannot do what he did. First of all, his hajj, he made all three hajj. He made qiran, 
right? He made uh, ifrad and he made tamattu on the same hajj. He, everybody saw him doing three different types of hajj. And that's warad. So the Prophet ﷺ, these are uh, mu'jizat. The Prophet ﷺ could not, I mean, he, uh, the amount of ibadah he did, I mean, I saw it, to be honest with you, and I've seen it with the marabitun, and I know Sheikh Muhammad Bufaris has had this experience as well, and anybody who spent time with, you know, real shiuch, at the, 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 these rare individuals that are there, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least give us their company uh, if we're not from them. May Allah make us from them, but at least give us their company. But Murabt al-Hajj, what he did on a daily basis, I don't know how he did it. Just from ibadah. Not to mention working and teaching, all the things that he did, but it was amazing just to see how much he could do. And, and how did Fakhruddin al-Razi do what he did? How Even Fakhruddin says in the Muqaddimah of his Mafatih al-Ghayb, he says, I know that one man could not learn what I learned in my lifetime. Like he knew that there was something supernatural about his, these are karamat. How could Imam Nawawi do what he did he, he was a teacher, he was a mufti, he was doing all these things. How could he do what he did? How could he produce what he did? Just look at the writing that they produced. How, how, could, uh, how could they write 300, 400 books? Imam Suyuti, how could he write all those books? And these, peop these men were men of the world as well. They were not just in, in their, um, you know, in ziwa. They weren't just uh, people in isolation. They were people engaged with the world. It's amazing, Nasiruddin Atusi, amazing. I mean, he was, a, he, he, he's noted for mathematics in the West. So he's a polymath in mathematics. Um, he, his Ilm al -Hay'a, his books on Ilm al -Hay'a are famous books in the Muslim world. But then he has all of these other areas. Raghab al how did he do what he did? I mean, these are just amazing things. So, so this, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is letting us know that the nawahi are da'ima. They're always there. They're always to be uh, avoided. Whereas the awamir are min fetra ila fetra. Like the prayer comes five times a day. You can pray extra prayers, nafida, except in the times of nahi. But other than that, the, 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 the awamir come when they come. Whereas the nawahi, you're always in a state where you have to avoid what's prohibited. And that's why they're focused. So the first one is that you should be shay'a. And that's the most important because Allah will not forgive, does not forgive that he is associated with. And it's very important that that's put in mabni lil majhul. Um, and there's a secret in that. But Allah will not forgive uh, the act of associating with him, but he will forgive less than that. And that's obviously with knowledge. You know, Don't set up idols with God knowingly. That's called jumla haliya. So, so it's very important that somebody who's in ignorance, you know, we don't punish people until they know what they're doing is wrong. So that's very important to, to note there. So, do not steal. And sariqa is, um, it's one of the worst things, and it's, in our culture, it's really breaking down. Like, when I was younger, theft was very unusual. Now, it's just people don't seem to have any problem stealing. And part of that is because the Marxists had ha have had such an influence on people uh, in this, the idea that all property is theft, that corporations, you know, steal from us so we can steal from them. That, I mean, it's, it, this is, this is a, but, but theft is one of the worst things. It's one of the worst things. And that's why Hivl al-Mal, the, the, the protection of property is one of the five universals in our religion and it's foundational. Wa man mata duna malihi mata shahida. 
If you die defending your property, you die a, a martyr because property is very important. And I was on this commission where, you know, I was talking about the importance of property and that, and, and that. And this is why uh, Richard Weaver says, it's if you lose the, the, the property as, as, a, as a, 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 a foundational principle in a society, he said there's no hope for rebuilding the society once that's lost. And he said you could actually rebuild a society as long as people recognize that. And proper, proprium, you know, like you learn this in logic, right? The, the, the property of something, it, yourself is a property. That's why we have, um, you know, we have uh, proxemics is this whole science of studying, uh, you know, space around people. Because different cultures have, like in the Arab culture, they come closer because they're more intimate culture than Western culture. In Western culture, they don't like you to get too close to them. In Arab culture, and that was for me when I lived in the Arab world, it was something I initially, I wasn't accustomed to it, but I got used to it because Arabs will speak closer to you than they will in the West. If you notice when you get on a, on a, um, if you get on a elevator, people are very, you know, they get very stressed out on elevators. They don't talk, they kind of like, look, because they're all too close. You've entered into that, because that's proprium, that's, that's your property, that space around you is, there's a sanctity to that space. And that's why hitting is, is a violation, like tort law, you know, this idea of like, you know, because you can really, you know, you can reduce things to, to basically, you know, law can be reduced to two fundamental principles. Uh, do what you promise to do and don't harm. La darar wa la dirar. So property is very important. That's why it's emphasized. Wa la tasriqu. As-sariqu wa sariqatu. Right? Faqtar aydihuma. Like, th this is a strong injunction. Obviously, it's very difficult to, to get your hand cut off in sharia. Um, in, in the uh, Brunei law, they have 16 conditions before you can fulfill that. And the, the, one of the British lawyers that actually worked on that said, whoever fulfills all these deserves to get his hand cut off. So it, it, they say in 800 years, Ottomans never cut hands off. You know, it's very difficult. First of all, if, if, you st if somebody steals from your store, you don't have to take it to the government. You can just let that person. There's an amazing... I think he was Bengali or Pakistani. Uh, people might have seen this about the man who tried to rob him. And then, and then he actually flipped it on him. But then he said, why are you doing this? He said, I'm hungry. And he said, no, no, take some food. And then he gave him $20. And then he ended up sh saying shahada with him. <laughs> he said, I want to be like you. <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, there, there's a reality to that also, that, that uh, there are desperate people. And in fact, in our... Even in Christianity, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that, the, the permissibility. If, if nobody's feeding you and, and you're starving to death, you can actually break into a bakery and take bread, right? Al-Dururat, So this is a kind of universal understanding that, because haq al is a right of people. Like, it's a haq to save a life. Like, if you see a drowning person, you can't ignore that. If you can swim and you can save that life, you have a moral responsibility to save that person. It's a haqqan in qab. So, so that's very important. What that says, no. Next, lineage. So property, family. See, these are the universals in this bay'ah. If you really look at them, you will see the, the uh, kulliyat al-khams in this bay'ah. These are, these are the, in, when you learn, you know, in usul al-fiqh, you learn these kulliyat. They're all in this bay'ah, they're all there. So this is to protect family and lineage. وَلَا تَزْنُوا لَا تَقْرَبُوا زِنَا إِنُّهُ فَاحِشَا وَسَأَ السَّبِيلَ Don't go near zina because it's a foul thing and it leads down a foul road. It's a terrible path, it breaks the society down. There's a book on sex and culture um, that was written in the 1930s, 1934. Unwin. And in this book, he, he studied over 80 cultures and he found whenever they released prenuptial sex, sex before marriage, that it destroyed the culture within three generations, a generation being 33 years, according to him. 
And he said he found no exception. And he wasn't a Christian. He was actually an atheist anthropologist. But he said maybe religion has some wisdom in, in, in worrying about these things. I mean, I got a, an e email from a, somebody the other day from a Muslim country, and he was in an illicit relation, and he was saying that he was having all this guilt, and he was asking me what to do, but he said, unfortunately, it's become normal now in my country. And this was a Muslim country. So young people now, these are breaking down. These are very bad signs for a culture. They're very bad signs. And that's why we, we guard against these things to protect, first and foremost, ourselves. Qu anfusukum wa ahlikum, right? Save yourselves. You know, when the, on the airplane, they say, first put the mask on your own face before even your child, right? Because you can't help the person. If you're, if you're la tulq bi'aydikum ila tahrika, don't destroy yourselves. So that's really important. And zina in Arabic means both fornication and adultery. In, in English, we distinguish between the two. This, every pagan culture has child sacrifice. South America, they found a huge grave recently in, I think, Peru of child sacrifice. This was done all over the world. This is Iblis. Iblis. Killing children. The most innocent. لا تقتلوا أولادكم والجنين ولد ما دام في بطن أمه. This is what Raghav Rasbahani says. The janin, the fetus, is a child. الجنين ولد ما دام في بطن أمه. In other words, you call a walad a janin in the button of the um, but it's still a walad. It just has the name janin because it's hidden from you. So once it takes human form, it's, it's, a, it's a human being. And that happens very quickly in the womb. So, so لا تقتلوا أولادكم In the Quran, خشية إملاق You know, out of fear of poverty, which is the, the, one of the main reasons. There's, there's two dominant reasons. The incest, rape, all these things is like less than 1% of abortions. The real reason for abortion, two fundamental reasons. Fear of poverty and interference with my career. Those are two reasons. There's an American entertainer who, who was being interviewed and somebody said to him, you know, oh, do you... Uh, So, so what do you think about abortion? He said, I'm against abortion. And the person was surprised because they thought he would not be against abortion. He said, I'm against abortion. He said, you don't think a, a woman has a right to determine what happens in her own body? He said, well, I suppose everybody has a right to be selfish. This is a great answer because that's what it is. It's you're saying, you know. And that's why as our culture becomes more and more narcissistic, a lot of people don't want to have children anymore because they're, they're a hassle. And there is an element to children that is a hassle. Every parent knows that. But, but they're a great blessing. They're one of the greatest blessings in life. So, so that's a really important letter. And Qadi Abu Bakr in Ahkam al Quran, he says about this he says, it was infanticide. And he said, and also concealing a pregnancy. Like, because there were women who could conceal it. And obviously, when you have the type of clothes that Muslim women wore in traditional societies, you could hide. And then, you know, in, in many traditional societies, women were, uh, you know, they, they, they carried weight. Most, most traditional cultures, even in this culture, not that long ago, women were, it was preferred to be hefty than it was to be skinny. So, so, so he says, min uh, rishta. You know, and so rishta is, waradu uh, rishta is a child born in zawaj shar'i. So ghayru rishta or rashta, they're both correct, is a, an illegitimate child. And he says, 
ورميه كقتله رميو you know so what they would do and this is very common in Greek culture and Roman culture when the child was born if it had defects they they didn't want to just kill it because uh, you know it's not easy to kill a human so they would just take it out into the forest or something I mean this is a famous uh, shepherd who left um, Odysseus right uh, sorry Oedipus um, in the famous Sophocles trilogy. Um, he, he, he couldn't kill him. He was told to go out and kill him, but he doesn't. He just leaves him, uh, and somebody finds him. You have find this motif in many, many stories. So, so this is, uh, and unfortunately, this happens in many countries, even here. They, they'll find a live baby in a garbage can. This is in America. You see this. This happens in uh, Muslim countries, I guarantee you. And it's usually from illegitimacy. And that's why, لا تقربوا زنا. Don't go near zina. Right? ولا تقتلوا أنفسكم. It's related. You know? It's related. ولا تقتلوا أولادكم. Right? It's related. Zina and killing is related. And then, ولا تأتوا ببهتان تفترينه بين أيديكم وأرجلكم. Buhtan is, is the worst it's, Bahtan is to tell a lie about somebody that's so heinous. And that's why it says, you know, تَفْتَرُونَهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَأَرْجُلِكُمْ You make this up. Iftira is to make something up. Bahtan comes from Bahita, you know, the Mabhut is somebody who's shocked. They're in a state of perplexion. They're just shocked. How, what? They said that? That I did that? What? And so it's a, it's a horrific thing to do, and it has a terrible end for people that do that. Bohtan, one of the things, Baina Aidikum is about wealth, according to some. There are many interpretations about what these words mean. Wa'arjulikum uh, is to claim that they had the adultery or fornication or something, um, rape to accuse somebody of rape. These are very heinous uh, things. And if they're false allegations, you are in big trouble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, this happened to Mary. This is in the Talmud. They, they, the Jews accused uh, Mary of having illicit relations with a Roman centurion named Panthera. Uh, Dr. Ali, if he was here, he would confirm. Oh, you are here. Yeah, right. It's Panthera, right? Yeah. So Talmud, if you read that book, uh, uh, Jesus and the Talmud uh, by Schaefer. Yeah, Schaefer. He's a very solid uh, scholar of the Talmud. Uh, you know, it's pretty horrible what, what was said about Jesus' mother. That's Bhutan, because she was innocent. Uh, Aisha was accused, innocent. Um, there's, a, there's a famous story of... Um, uh, Imam al-Baqallani, the great Maliki, Qadi, and, and Mutakallam, who, who was sent by the, uh, the caliph to, uh, to the Byzantines as an ambassador. And uh, the, the Byzantine ruler, you had to bow before him. So, so they told him, oh, if he comes, he's not going to bow. So he had them build a, on the doorway to really uh, low, so you had to bow just to come into the doorway. So when Qadi Abu Bakr got there, he looked and he realized what, so he came in backward. And, and, then, uh, and then when he saw the Asaqifa, you know, these uh, bishops, he said to them, uh, MashaAllah, كيف الأهل والعيال? And how, how, how are your wives and your children? And they looked and he said, you're a scholar and you, we're نتنزه عن الأولاد و like we, we, we're, we're above having families. <laughs> we're too holy for that. And he said, Subhanallah, tansibun ila Allah al ahl wal iyal. Like you, you say God has a family <laughs> and children, and then, but you yourself. <laughs> and, and, then, and, then, and then the last one, they said, Tell us about the hadith of ifk, you know, because they study Islam. And he said, Naam imra'atani tuhimata bizina. Two great women were accused of um, 
of adultery, of fornication, adultery. And he said, Maryam wa Aisha. Amma Maryam fahamalat wa barra'ha Allah. Mary got pregnant, but Allah said she's innocent. Wa amma Aisha falam tahmal. Aisha didn't get pregnant, and Allah said she was innocent. <laughs> so those are the kind of ulama we had. Allahu yeah. Akbar. So, so, buhtan is a very evil thing. Yeah, it's horrible. And then, wala ta'asufi ma'roof. Don't disobey in any ma'roof. So if you look at these, this is really about uh, authority. And, and you're basically, you're entering into a, a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger that you're not going to do any of these things. And this is essentially, uh, you know, the, the things that most destroy. If you look at this, these are the things that most break down societies. Just look at the things there. Theft, you know, uh, illicit sex, murder. This is mafhum, right? Like, you know, it's like, uff. Don't say to your parents, oof, mafhum al-awla. So if you can't kill children, like that's, that's the, the, little, the least of you, then it goes up. So it, it, it's, it goes up. Waratatu bi buhtan, gossip, lies, all these things that break down society. And then waratasufi ma'roof, you know, do good things, do, do virtuous things. And this is why, so the imam is very important. And the bay'ah traditionally, there's only a few countries that have this now. Malaysia still has it because they have the sultans. Um, the, the Gulf states still have this idea of bay'ah. Morocco still has the bay'ah. In fact, Jews from diaspora come to Morocco when there's a new king and the, the Jewish leadership comes and gives bay'ah. Um, so, so, so it's very important. Uh, in Imam Laqani, uh, in his uh, in his Joharat uh, Tawheed wa wajibu nasbu Imam Al Adri bi shari fa'lam la bi hukm al aqli that it's an obligation to have a, an Imam. You have to have an Imam. In other words, you have to have political leadership. This is also one of the seven Noahidic. Right? You have to have courts. You have to establish justice. So there has to be some type of government. Uh, to redress wrongs. And, and, and the sultan is very important. You know, one of the things, I mean, we don't support tyranny. No, nobody, a'udhu billah, you know, anybody that would even suggest that, that, that we don't support tyranny. But we also don't support anarchy. And so sometimes uh, government that's bad is better than no government at all. And that's why the traditional ulama were against Khuruj al hakim because they saw that it, it, it led to worse uh, tribulations, the breakdown of a society. And this is why, if you look, you know, and, and unfortunately we have these kind of people that want to bring down all the governments and create all this uh, human suffering for some greater good that's going to come. This, the communists did this. You know, they killed millions, tens of millions of people to bring about this quote unquote equal society. But these are lies. The, they're, the dunya is what the dunya is. And it, according to us, amadakum, amadakum, you know, your actions are what give you your, your, uh, your leadership. When, and this is why one of the most important books to read in, in this area is Siraj al Muluk by Abu Bakr al Tortushi. Anybody that reads that book will, will change their view. And this is one of the great scholars who, who had nothing to do with governments. He was an extremely wara person. But this idea that you just abandon governments and have nothing to do with governments, there's people that can do that. But if everybody does that, then who, who's in the government? Even Fir'aun had a believer in the inner circle. Fir'aun. Like, and he's told Pharaoh, you know, are you going to kill a man because he says his Lord is Allah? So even in the inner sanctum of Pharaoh, there was a believer. 
So this idea somehow that, no, we have nothing to do, what, oh, well then what, how, if we abandon political process, then the only alternative is, is, is power struggles where people just kill each other. So it's, you know, and these are ishtihad issues, recognizably, and it's definitely safer to stay out of these situations. Many of the fuqaha did not have anything to do, but many of them did. Uh, Muhammad al-Shaybani and Abu Yusuf disagreed on that. Abu Yusuf became a qadi. Muhammad al-Shaybani did not, and he, he thought he shouldn't be involved with them. Abu Hanifa wouldn't, wouldn't take the qada, but to say that Abu Yusuf is not a rightly guided person, and the same is true for many of the great qadiyyad was a qadi. Many of our greatest ulama were, they were jurists, they were fuqaha, some of them were ministers. And, and, not, and every government is gonna have problems. So the bay'ah is very important, uh, and this is also in the, the three vows, right? Dr. Ali, the, 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 the Jews in diaspora, um, they have to take these traditionally, the Tittlebaum group, right? So these are the, the ones that support the Palestinians, the Rabbi Tittlebaum's uh, people. You see these guys at demonstrations with Palestinian flags, and they really bother um, the, the Zionists, but um, they follow uh, this rabbi who, who affirmed a traditional Jewish position in Orthodox Judaism, which was that they could not go back to Palestine until, en masse until, so in other words, Aliyah, what they call Aliyah. They could not do that until the Messiah comes. That was the traditional position. But one of the three vows was that you do not go against your government. And this was the traditional Muslim position. And this is why even living in, um, two days before 9-11, I actually gave a talk in Philadelphia on the prohibition of breaking the law in a non-Muslim land. Two days before. And uh, I think it's really important for Muslims who are in the United States, we don't break the law. It's, this, it's haram to break the law. And if, the law, if you can't live by the laws, you make hijrah. But you don't break the laws of the land you live in. And there's a ulama that say insurance is haram. And, uh, but in this state, you have to have car. If you're going to drive a car, you have to have liability insurance. You can't break that law. So it's very important for Muslims to know that this hadith is extremely important. أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُولِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ and ul al-amri includes living, if you're in a non-Muslim land, the ul al-amri are the, pe the people in power over you. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't disobey the law. You have to make hijrah. And there's places you can go to. There's places. They're difficult places to live. But you can go there. You don't have to live here. So uh, if you're here, though, you have to obey the law. And then he said, فَمَنْ وَفَّ مِنْكُمْ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَصَابَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Oh, and then, you know, uh, Laqani says uh, about that, وَلَيْسَ رُكْنًا يُعْتَقَدْ فِي الدِّينِ فَلَا تُزِيغْ عَنْ أَمْرِهُ الْمُبِينِ This is not a rukn in the religion. In other words, if somebody doesn't believe in the political aspect of Islam, it doesn't take them out of Islam. Like if they say, I don't believe in like Khilafah or any of these things, it doesn't take them out of Islam. Because uh, the Mu'tazirite said it was a hukum aqli, it wasn't shari. In other words, it was a rational thing that it's wise to have governments and things like that. But it's not ma'loom min adeen bad darura. It's not a rukun from the, it is from the deen to have a governor, a, a ruler. But, فَلَا تُزِغْ عَنْ أَمْرِهُ الْمُبِينِ إِلَّا بِكُفْنٍ فَانْبِذَنَّ عَهْدًا فَاللَّهُ يَكْفِينَ أَذَاهُ وَحْدَهُ You know, unless you see kufr buwaah, لَكَ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ سُلْطَانِ Burhan. So, so you cannot disobey a ruler or go out of the, unless, if, if you're in a Muslim land and, and the ruler declares his kufr. At that point, the ahad is broken. But if you come into a land or are born into a land where they're non-Muslims, you have a, uh, 
the, what's the term that uh, Voltaire used? Uh, okay, it's eluding me by fasting. I'm doing the brain doesn't work as well. Um, you know, your civil contract. So you, you, you know, there's a civil contract that you've born into. Yeah, the social contract. Yeah. So, so you, you know, we're born into that. And so that, that's, uh, that's reality. So we have to, uh, uh, to obey that. And then he says, unless it's kufr buah, and the Prophet ﷺ says, they asked him if they see something wrong. He said, لا ما صلو, ما صلو, as long as they pray. So the prayer is the least, you know, if you hold to the prayer. You can't go against them. And that's why the revolutions, they bring a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look at all these countries where these things have happened, people are still suffering greatly. They're really suffering. And it was bad before. It's not to deny that. And they were oppressive. But Nidham is better than Fawda. And that's why Madik said 60 years under an op a, a Zalim is better than a day of anarchy because it just destroys everything. Anyway, that's a traditional view. It's not my view, I'm, I, trust me. I mean, there's people who think I'm just, this is, this is what's in, I mean, isn't it? I'm, huh? What's that? This is what all the ulama said. It's a, and, and now, because Marxism came in and, and you know, these, these revolutionary ideas came into Islam, if you look at the Muslims, like, the ulama in Morocco, when they lost to the French, they fought, and they fought hard. The Indians fought. You know, Muslims really fought the colonialists. They didn't just surrender those lands. But once they were conquered and saw that there's just, it's, now it's nihilistic. It's just bloodshed for no purpose. At that point, they stopped. And that's why if you read, there's a book called Oppressed in the Land. It's really worth reading. It's all the fatwas of the ulama during col uh, colonization. And they all said, as long as they're not stopping you from practicing your religion, don't oppose them. Because it'll bring more harm on the community than benefit if you can't defeat them. And that's why the Begum of Bhopal, you know, they have these women, the seven Begums. I think there's seven. The Begums of Bhopal. Do you know about them? Any other ladies? Never heard of the Begums of Bhopal. He's like one of the Mafkhara of India. These are women that ruled uh, the province of Bhopal. Um, there, there's an amazing picture of the, one of the Begums with meeting the Viceroy of England, and she's in a complete purda, you know? <laughs> and he's like towering over her. But she ruled the country. Bhopal was the only place during the, the Muslim rebellion nobody was killed because the Begums prohibited the ulama from riling the masses up. It's the only place. And so it's not like we, we, we want to see justice. We, I mean, I prefer more rahmah in the world, but justice for a ruler, you want to see a just ruler. You want to see rahmah amongst the people, but you definitely want to see the government uh, being just with the people. So nobody supports tyranny. Nobody supports evil. Anybody that could support what's happening right now in Gaza, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'm shocked at the... Uh, are, uh, you know, I'm not all of them. There many Jewish people have come out against this because they see it for what it is. But unfortunately, a lot of these rabbis, it's just been shocking that they haven't come out against this. I mean, it's more the, the secular Jews that can see it for what it is. So there's a religious element here that, and this is one of the things what uh, Voltaire, it's in, in many ways rightly said, you know, um, for good, uh, for, for good men to do evil, it takes religion to get good people to do evil things. And that's mi misunderstood religion. Religion can be very, very uh, distorting. When, when you think God's on your side, we don't, we don't believe that. We don't know when God's on our side. We hope God's on our side. But God is not always on our side. If we're not on the side of truth and righteousness and justice, God's not on our side. Even if we're Muslims, we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. God's on your side when you're on God's side. And then he says, uh, uh, صرفه, So other than kufr, you cannot remove the ruler. This is aqidah. This was taught in Azhar for, for 400 years. 
That was the aqidah of the Muslims. But it goes back to the, these things that man ata al amir faqad atani, wa man asa al amir faqad asani. Whoever obeys the person in, in, in charge has obeyed me, and whoever disobeys him has disobeyed me. So, 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 so he says, even if they go from being a just ruler to an unjust ruler, you still don't uh, remove them. Even uh, Sheikh Abdullah, when they had the, 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 the ruler, the woman was elected prime minister, he said that there, you, you had to f do that because to go against it would be greater harm. You know, and this is some, something the modern Muslims just, I don't know. There's enough historical evidence to see. But we pray for justice and we pray for just rulers, you know, in government. I mean, I don't, we don't pray for justice. I don't want justice for myself. None of us, do, do you really want God to be just with you? I don't think so. Yeah, I want mercy, you know. The Prophet said, subhanAllah, you know what, you know what they, 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 they he, when he would say to the women when he took bayah, he said, Ma, uh, uh, you know, do what you're able to do. And the, and the women would say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Arhamu bina min anfusina. Allah and his messenger are more merciful to us than we are to our own selves. Yeah, SubhanAllah. This is a religion is about rahmah. You know, we need more rahmah. And sins bring on. You know, be forewarned that if you go against the Prophet's his um, Amr, then you're going to have calamities and painful chastisement. Muslims, we're not immune to uh, we're not immune to the Sunan of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I mean, the Jews when they said Nahnu Allah, you know. You know, we're the children of God and, and the beloved of God. Allah said, no, you're Bashar, you're just human beings. Like, if, if that's true, why does he punish you? So the Muslims, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Because chosen people syndrome is a dangerous syndrome. Just to think that you have some special ontological status just because you say something. In the battle of Yamama, uh, Abbad ibn Bishr, one of, one of the, he's the famous one who got shot and didn't feel it. You know, he kept praying, got shot with an arrow. He was with the Ammar ibn Yasser. But, but he said, Ya Ahl al Quran, because they were being routed. Khalid ibn Walid was ahead, and Musaylim al Kadhab, he had uh, thousands. I mean, I think like over 10,000 died. It was a hor horrific uh, battle. But they, he had that, and they were losing. The Muslims were losing. And Khalid was very concerned. Abad ibn Bishrish, Ya Ahl al Quran, Ya Ahl al Quran, Zayyinu al Quran bil fi'al, adorn this book with your actions. Don't just let it be words. You know, live by it. Can a khuluq al Quran? He lived by the Quran. He was the Quran walking. Allah. So then. فَمَنْ وَفَّ مِنْكُمْ فَأَجْرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ Whoever fulfills it, his reward is with God. So there's the reciprocation, you see? The, the مُبَايَعَةِ So, إِنَّ اللَّهِ اشْتَرَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ الْجَنَّةِ So this is the transaction. Allah bought our souls, our lives and our wealth, and against it is paradise. So... Whoever fulfills this, فَأَجْرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَصَابَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا The hudud, like if you go, because تِرْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا These are the hudud of Allah, don't transgress the hudud. So if you transgress the had, the had punishment is restorative. It, 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 it brings you back into, so, so, so whoever, so that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, فَعُوقِبَ فِي الدُّنْيَا فَهُوَ كَفَارَةُ اللَّهِ That removes it. So if you're punished in the dunya, they say, some say شَرْطَ tawbah and others say, even you don't have شَرْطَ tawbah. Just the fact you got the had, it finishes it. You know, but شَرْطَ tawbah makes more sense to me. Um, so, so فَهُوَ كَفَارَةُ اللَّهُ It removes his sin. So if you... You know, if you're punished in this, and that's why Sahaba, the only, uh, the jeld that occurred 
and, and, and Rajam at the time, it was from confessions. People went and confessed to the Prophet Sallallahu and because they wanted to be purified in the dunya. They didn't want to take their chances in the akhirah. That's how strong their iman was. And so, وَمَنْ أَصَابَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا ثُمَّ سَطْرُهُ وَاللَّهِ فَهُوَ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنْ شَاءَ عَفَى عَنْهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ قَبْهُ So if you do one of these kaba'ir, I mean the sagha'ir are lamam, you know, they're removed by wudu, by salah al-khams, by, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, if you, if you saw, you know, لَوْ كَانَ لِيَحْدِكُمْ نَهْرٌ يَقْتَزُرْ بِهِ خَمْسْ مَرَّاتِ فِي النَّهَارِ هَلْ يَبْقَ مِنْ دَرِينِهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ قَلَا يَبْقَ مِنْ دَرِينِهِ شَيْءٍ The Prophet said, if one of you had a river that he went out and bathed in it five times a day, would, would he have any soil on him? Would he have, would you see any uh, filth on him? They said, no, you wouldn't see any filth. He said, that's the five prayers. But that's sagha'ir, you know. And so this is about kaba'ir. Like if any of these, because these are all related to kaba'ir. These things in the bay'ah, these are all related to kabair. So if you do any of them and you're not punished in this world, Allah veils you, fahuwa illallah, in sha'afa. And that's why tonight uh, I wanted to get to the hadith about um, Laylat al Qadr because it's here. Um, Allah. So that's why tonight begins the last 10 nights. And what is the dua? Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tahibbil afwa fa'afu anna. You are the forgiver, the pardoner of sins. You love to pardon, so pardon us. So, so that's really important because whatever sins you've done, you're in the mashia of Allah. And, and you should have some trepidation about it until right before death. In, in the last phase of your life, inshallah, may all of you reach uh, a ripe old age after lots of ibadah and good deeds and ma'roof. But, but if, when you reach the end of your life, you have to remove all fear. It's, it's khawf and raja. La budda min alayhi khawf and ma'ar raja. Right? Have the two sandals of fear and hope. But, but right before you die, you give up fear and just trust that Allah, husn al billah, have a good opinion of your Lord. Like the man who... He burnt himself. He, he, he had in his will, he told his sons to burn him and then shatter, to take his ashes and just throw them to the wind. So Allah reassembled him and asked him why he did it. And he said, out of fear of punishment, in the hadith, Allah forgave him. That act was an act of kufr. Because astajiz Allah. He, he, he didn't think Allah could bring him back together. So the, the actual act was an act of kufr, but the fear saved him. The fear of Allah. So, so, so the, the, just to finish this on the, um, on the, Allahumma uh, salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. The Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, the hadith, man uh, sama, من قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر الله له ما تقدم من ذنبه. It's here somewhere. So the uh, you know there's there's a different view on this. Yeah, here it is. عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله من يقوم ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا so whoever, Abu Huraira relates that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever, man yaqum, whoever stands, laylat al-qadri, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahum ma taqadama min dhanbihi. What, 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 what proceeded of his sins uh, will be forgiven. So this, uh, you know, there's a big khilaf about when laylat al-qadr is, um, there, there is a hadith to seek it out on the, the last 10 nights, hadith seek it out on the odd nights. There's indications it's on the 27th night, which is traditionally where a lot of Muslims fast. The word hiya in, in anzal nahu fi laylat al qadri, when you get to hiya, uh, it's the 27th word in, in, in that surah. Ibn Abbas pointed that out. 
as a kind of ishara. But the, the Maniki position, Ibn Abi Jamra holds that it's any time during the year. And that's why in the Maniki Madhab, it's actually encouraged to do tahajjud throughout the year. And, and on the first day of the year, because Malikis, you only have to do the niyyah one time. Like in Ramadan, we do it the first day, the, you know, the night. We make the niyyah for the whole month, and that, that suffices unless you like, get sick and stop fasting or, or you go on a journey and break your fast. Then you have to renew it. But just that first niyyah is good for the whole month. Although, خروج عن الخلاف مستحب, it's good to get out of khilaf. So the Shafi'is who, who do it every day, um, the Madikis say, you know, it's a good thing to do it, just to renew it. But you only need it once. So they make the niyyah uh, to, to stand in Layla al Qadr. And then they do tahajjud every night throughout the year with the hopes of hitting Layla al Qadr. Because some say it's nafs Sha'ban. There's an opinion that it's on the... the and, and then some say it moves throughout the year. Allah akhfahu. They say, the Moroccans say, uh, Allah hid three things in three things. He hid his saints amongst humanity. So you never know who's a wali of Allah. He hid his acceptance um, in, 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 in the good deeds. You know, like you never know what deed's going to save you. Like the woman who gave the dog, the thirsty dog. If she was a prostitute, she gave the thirsty dog water and Allah forgave her. And, and then also his wrath in, the, um, in, in, in his disobedience. But he also hid Laylat al-Qadr. So it, it's to encourage us, especially in these last 10 nights. Um, it's a great blessing. So it's about 5.8 years, right? 83. Yeah, so 83 years. That's a lot of ibadah. So that was given to the Prophet because the ancients had these long lives with a lot of ibadah. So, um, alhamdulillah, it's a great blessing. Um, there's different opinions about what the Qadr is. Is it the decree that is revealed to the angels for the, the coming year? Allah Ta'ala Anam. But Imanan, believing in it, Wahtisaban, Yahtasibu and Allah, like really believe that Allah is going to uh, to to forgive you and yeah, Alhamdulillah. So Ibn Abi Jamra says, doesn't mean you have to stay up the whole night or or just a part of the night. He actually prefers the opinion that as long as you do eleven rakats, you get the reward of the night. But obviously, the more you do, the better. But he says, if you do the 11 rakats, that was the norm of the Prophet. He did eight, and then he would do the shafa and witar, 11. There's a, another opinion, a weaker opinion of 13. In any case, if you do those, and there's a, he actually mentions a hadith that even if you do two rakats with um, the last two ayahs of Baqarah, because there's a hadith, uh, that he he relates is usually related to whoever reads it, but he relates it. Man qama bi bi khawatim al baqara kafatah. Just to do those two would be enough. So Allah's rahmah is vast. May Allah accept our sin, our our, uh, our, our uh, sincere fasting and and uh, accept our standing in prayer and all these things. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعفو عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعفو عنا اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وتقبل منا صيامنا وقيامنا اللهم اللهم أدركنا ليلة القدر و إن شاء الله بارك في أخواننا وأحبابنا في كل مكان كل من أوصانا بالدعاء نسأل الله أن توفق إخواننا في غزة والله يخفف عنهم ويعطيهم ما يحتاجون نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يبارك في هذا المكان ويحفظ هذا المكان من كل شر ومن كل مكروه ومن كل بدعة ومن كل شنيعة يا رحم الرحيمين
وصلي لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلاما وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين